I serve as the geographic information officer for the County of Los Angeles. I don't know if that puts me in industry, it's local government. Um, I also have a foot in the academic world. I uh, spent the first half of my career as a professor of geospatial science up at Humboldt State University in Northern California. Um, and when I came to SoCal um, and moved into the public sector, uh, I still keep a toe in the water of, of academia as well. So I think I'm straddling both those fences a little bit um, as we go forward. So that's a little bit about me. I'm not going to give you my full story. Uh, you can find my LinkedIn page if you care to know more. So let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a, a, a mix of topics here on how we're using geospatial and location technology in the local government sector. Um, I did put in some of the buzzwords to get your attention in my, my presentation description on uh, machine learning and image analysis, and I will get to those, I promise, uh, at several points through the talk. But first, I want to start out, I'll give you a little bit of background on the county, just uh, since this is Orange County, I'm sure some of you actually have been to LA County but uh, you may not know the whole context. Then talk a bit about uh, how local government uses spatial information. And I think that's applicable, not just to the examples I'll share, but also any local government agency, whether that's a city, a county, uh, a state, uh, sort of the, the people closer in government to, to your daily lives. Um, talk through a few use cases about uh, ways we're using GIS in, in the county and some of our specific projects. And then I'm going to end on uh, sort of a, an ask and sort of a, an, an, a, an FYI on how you can leverage some of the resources and data that we and local government are collecting all the time. And much of it is open and available for private industry, for academia, for others to use to build their own applications or tools, um, and that happens very frequently, leveraging government data for uh, private sector or, or research and things like that. And, and lastly, to talk a little bit about maybe ways you can work with local government or support local government by developing products and services and tools that would benefit some of the needs I'll talk through as we go. So that's the game plan. Um, if all goes well, I'll stay on schedule. Uh, somebody can poke me if I seem like I'm getting long. Um, but uh, there are slide numbers down there for our moderators. I have 39 slides. So if you see I'm only on seven and we're five minutes to go, I have a problem. Okay, so a little bit on LA County, just for context. Um, LA County is big. Um, it has over 10 million residents. It's the largest in the country by population. Um, and if we were a state, it would be one of the top 10 states in the country. I, I waffled a little bit because I don't have the newest census numbers yet, uh, but we were number nine uh, after the last census and I suspect it'll stay in that top 10 more or less. It's over 4,000 square miles of land area. So it's a, a fairly big chunk of real estate as well. And everything shown on that map there in pink is the unincorporated parts of the county. The unincorporated being the areas that are not incorporated cities, Los Angeles, Long Beach, Pasadena, go down the list. Um, LA County actually has 88 incorporated cities. So we deal with a lot of interaction across government agencies within the county. Uh, but the county itself is responsible for all government services in the pink areas and then through contract services, primarily fire and policing uh, with cities, we provide contract services to over 50 of our cities in the county. So what that means is when you talk about data and location and analytics and so on, um, we're dealing with a large complex uh, set of interactions between organizations. We're dealing with a large number of people as our residents, not to mention all of the others who visit the county uh, for work, for play, for other things. Um, I'm guilty of that. I live in Orange County, I work in LA County. So I'm not counted in the 10 million. From a structural standpoint, the county is also big and complex. We have 37 different county departments. In my role, I work with every one of those departments fairly frequently, um, some more than others, but I work with all the departments across the county. We have a couple hundred different committees and commissions that get stood up for particular uh, things uh, as things are going. We've got lots of school districts, sanitation districts, water districts. Again, a lot of these are, are things that become interactions around data analytics and, and, so, and tools that touch on the GIS side. 
lots of employees, lots of buildings, lots of areas we manage in the natural environment, and lots of money, uh, $36 billion budget. That's bigger than most states. Uh, you know, it's, it, again, because we are bigger than most states. So a big complex state, uh, organization. And kind of the last thing I wanna say just at the organizational level is uh, my role. So I, as I said, I'm the geographic information officer. That sounds very similar to a CIO, but not quite the same uh, because my realm of operation is around all things that are geographic in nature. So I am the point for anything that involves geospatial methods, applications, and tools. I help work across the organization on our strategy and vision and how we implement these things across government. Um, and what I find most exciting, especially being a recovering academic, is the opportunity to work on innovation and look for new opportunities to apply these technologies to make our government function more effectively, more efficiently, more quickly, um, you know, have data-driven decisions that really make sense. Um, and in part that's done, at least from my perspective and the way I've approached this job, by trying to do wherever possible partnerships with both academia and industry and be one of the local governments in the nation that actually is often at the forefront of trying new approaches, trying new tools, working with different kinds of data sets that maybe others are going to wait on before they see how useful they are. So we, we get involved in quite a number of partnerships between industry and academia and government to try and push the envelope on a number of these things. And I'll touch on several of them today. Um, and overall, just coordinate. So there's a lot going on in geospatial. Um, and you know, fortunately, I don't have to deal with all the other things CIOs do. I don't deal with security. I don't deal with, you know, infrastructures and, you know, and policies on that side of the house. I don't have to worry if our email goes down. Uh, those are all the CIOs problem. So um, I sometimes jokingly say the GIO is just a little bit more than a CIO because I have a tail on my first letter. So in LA County, because we're big, we have an enterprise GIS structure, um, which sort of is, I describe as a hub and spoke structure. So we have an enterprise GIS program that sits at the center of all things geospatial in the county. And then it reaches out on the spokes to the different county departments, the different county partners across the agency and organizations. And what that does is gives us a very uh, effective means of providing services through shared infrastructure, shared platforms and data and workflows. Um, that may sound obvious to many of you in the IT space. That's how we try to do IT in most large organizations now. I would say just holistically, many GIS operations across local governments are not structured this way or not, uh, not entirely structured this way. Uh, LA County was in a different space maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago when each department kind of did its own thing around spatial tech, software technology, data technology um, applications, and nothing was compatible. So moving towards that centralized thing is really helpful. Um, another thing that has happened, especially in this last 16 months or so with COVID is We've seen a lot of opportunities for geospatial technologies to move what would have been field-based operations to desktop operations. So because people weren't able to get out uh, on the ground in a lot of cases and were working from home or because we weren't able to have people congregating, uh, the ability to actually start leveraging data, especially the imagery data, so we can see something in imagery instead of going out and looking at it on the ground, um, that started to become a very powerful tool for a number of our, our departments and programs that hadn't previously thought about how these kinds of emerging or well-established technologies in many cases could be used. Um, and even for those that um, that were using it, we've found a number of ways over the last 16 months or so to continue to optimize and improve on that and raise new questions about how we do that better. Um, so you can see there just on the screen, a couple of images. There's you know an example of, of a screenshot of our aerial photography. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, the spider diagram you kind of see up on the, on the upper right is actually something we originally had done for workforce optimization before COVID. We were interested in letting people not have to go to the office, but rather go to WeWork, WeWorks type sites to work 
in locations that might be uh, more convenient from where they live or more convenient um, for the meetings they had to hold. So one of the great applications there that we were able to do in the location realm was to do an analysis of all of the potential WeWorks type sites that were available in the region and cross check that against all 110,000 employee home addresses and run an optimization model to determine which WeWork sites should we contract with to minimize the number of miles driven collectively by county employees if they went to these sites versus to their assigned office location. Um, that project got started and then COVID hit and it all kind of shut down. But what we did in, in reverse was we started looking at how many miles were being saved by people working at home. Um, and I, I don't have all that data here in this presentation, uh, but do you imagine 100,000 plus people not driving to work every day in LA County, um, the amount of fuel savings, wear and tear on vehicles, time and commute, all those other factors, that's something we actually built out tools that we quantify that on a daily basis for every employee that registers as working at home on a given day. And that's rolled up to monthly reports to our executives to see what the cost savings are, to see how the office utilization looks going forward um, and through the time. And that's leading to decisions around, do we renew leases on certain office spaces? Do we maybe consolidate office spaces and go to a hoteling model? Um, not necessarily WeWorks, just in our own facilities um, to let people minimize that um, and meet a lot of our other regulations around air pollution and so on. So those were just a couple of simple examples that popped up very early for us looking at routing optimization and cost savings and, and time savings in that realm. But if we step back a little bit and just say, you know, a broad question, why does government care about maps? Why do we care about location data in local government at all? And I think when I start telling you examples, it's pretty obvious. Government does lots of service provisions uh, of all sorts. We have parks, clinics, schools, and so on. Um, those things happen in space and they serve a set of constituents. We have to figure out how many people can a clinic serve and can, you know, and, and if we need to add another clinic somewhere else because the one we have is overburdened um, or it's too far or it's not near a metro line where people can get there on public transit. Um, so there's a lot of ways that just thinking about how we allocate county resources to provide the services that we are expected to provide our constituents, um, how do we do that efficiently? How do we make sure we're hitting the places um, where those services are most effectively deployed or most, most needed? There's a number of ways, especially in the last couple of years where public participation is, is sort of at the forefront. It's always going on, but um, certainly big things like how we allocate voting. Uh, Orange County has done the same thing. We have the option now to vote you know, in drop boxes or vote at a number of different voting centers. We don't have to go to a specific you know, precinct location anymore. How did somebody decide where those locations should be for the vote centers and for the drop boxes? Uh, I assume Orange County did the same as we did. We did a, a large scale spatial analysis of our voter registration data, our polling locations, um, some other things around compliance for like ADA, Americans with Disability Act, to make sure locations were accessible according to those rules, space allocations and so on, to determine the best places to put those voting locations. Um, you know, doing census work and now redistricting work um, to figure out how jurisdictions get redistricted uh, this year is happens every, uh, every year that ends in a one, um, those processes are very public oriented. So we're spinning up, or we do spin up, um, public facing websites where people can build their own redistricting maps or they can build their own you know, uh, analysis for particular questions or, or run an analysis for a particular question that's important to them. And of course, the most important thing for government is we gotta get the funding to do all this, which is taxes. So using this kind of data and these kinds of tools to really understand how and where tax assessments are and fees are being uh, applied and are they being charged correctly. Um, and I'll just give a very quick example. I'll, I'll show you an image later. Um, if you double the size of your house with a big addition, which I see happen driving around 
Orange County and Irvine a little bit all, all the time. You know, people put these huge additions on their house. The home value goes up. The assessments should go up. How does the county know they need to do a reassessment on the house? Uh, well, if you pull the permit, they should know. But if you did something a little more clandestine or you did something, you know, that got missed for whatever reason, there are image processing methods we use to actually identify every building that's changed because we can look at the building footprints and see, oh, that building footprint grew or that building height changed or whatever it may be. So there's a lot of things that we do in government that are driven by map type data, location type data. Um, and in fact, I said this when I started at the county to the various execs I was talking to in my, my rounds, um, everything government does for the most part is location-based. And I just as suggest take a moment to think for yourself, what isn't location-based in government and in data? Most of the data um, that we collect has locations associated with it in some form, whether that's in a database, whether that's some kind of imagery like aerial imagery or street view imagery. Um, often the data these days are collected with location in mind. So they're the databases are built to know the where question, or you know, what's the, the latitude, longitude on the planet where that entity exists, and then the other attributes that go with it. Um, but then we also have a lot of data that is not necessarily collected with that in mind, but they still have location information in the database in some form. It might be a parcel number or an address. It might be an area like a jurisdiction or a service area. It might just be the name of a facility. The, you know, the park's name or the, or the office building's name uh, might be defined geographies like the Census Bureau uses. But all of these data sets, whether they're put into spatial formats intentionally or unintentionally, can be ingested into these kinds of spatial analytics that is the world I operate in. So a couple sort of just high level examples, and then I'll get into some more specific ones. Um, first off, addresses. Did you ever think about how your, your home address came to be? Uh, probably most of you haven't. It's not something you think about. You just move into a house and it has an address. Uh, but that is actually the responsibility of your local government. It's the responsibility of your, your county government of, specifically. So in any county in California or elsewhere, uh, when a new subdivision gets built, when streets are named and the, and the street addresses are assigned, that's all handled through a county department of some sort. In, in LA County, we have an addressing system uh, that we refer to as the Countywide Address Management System or CAMS, where we track every address in the county and we geolocate that. So we know the latitude longitude of any street address. Now, any of you who have ever used your phone to look up the location of anything on Apple Maps or Google Maps, you're benefiting from that government data without really realizing it. Because guess where Google and Apple call up or come to to get the latest address databases for, for LA County or for Orange County or anywhere else? They go to the government. We are the authoritative source of those addresses. Now they may do some checking and updating on their own um, to improve that or enhance that in various ways. But the official addresses that are in those systems are drawn from all of the local governments across the country. That's how they come into being, at least in the United States. So as a county, historically, that might have been done through some pretty rudimentary means of you know, sharing data through FTP sites or maybe far enough back, even sending you know, some kind of media around. Now we have all those types of things set up as web services. So anybody in the world who wants to use our addressing system can hit that service and build an application that does geocoding to any address in LA County. And the nice thing about leveraging it directly through the, the county government in this kind of a case is you have the most current, most accurate addressing available because when a new subdivision is built, we're the first ones to know it. We're the first ones to assign those addresses um, and when somebody says, oh, I couldn't find you when I looked you up in the phone because you live in a new subdivision, it's because there's a lag time, it's getting less, um, but there's a lag time for Google or Apple or whoever to grab that data from every county in the country and update their databases. Um, so that's how that works. Um, more importantly, on the county side, we, we care about this for, for very practical things. 
when you call 911, do they know where to go? More importantly, when you call 911, do they know who to deploy? Is it a city fire department? Is it a contracted fire department? Orange County, we have, you know, OC fire is across many jurisdictions. Um, so knowing when that 911 call comes in, who is responsible, whose jurisdiction is it, and who does it go to, um, that's all driven off these the quality of the address system. Or if it's not done well, um, people die. That's, that's a pretty weighty responsibility when you think about having addressing right. Um, I don't want my firefighter or my EMS service relying on Google or Apple Maps to find me if I live in a new housing subdivision. They may not have the data yet. Um, that may be a problem. So we have to coordinate with all those emergency responders to make sure that's happening. A little bit more concrete example from last year in LA County, and I'll come back to this later, uh, when we have fires and we have to evacuate people, how do we know how many people are in an area that's going to be evacuated and can the road system handle that number of vehicles evacuating, all the other factors that come into play there. Um, now that's all being driven by GIS-based analysis where we can say, okay, we have a fire perimeter, it's growing, it's moving into a given area. Um, it looks like we better evacuate people. We can start strategically planning how to evacuate people so we don't have traffic jams at, at the choke points. So we evacuate them in sequence and then repopulate in the opposite direction when people can go back. This idea has actually caught on significantly enough in the last year or so that our relatively new state geographic information officer is working with all the counties now to do a statewide version of this so we can manage across the entire state how when emergency events happen we can evacuate efficiently and effectively and and make sure people have time and traffic flow to get out of course i can't get away without mentioning COVID a little bit um, we had a whole slew of applications some of these are, are not as relevant as they were when i took screenshots um, that came out um, these are all public facing things that that are out there you know so where do you get tested what's going on in different parts of the county um, with infection rates what's uh, where can I go to the park or not, or the beach or not during different types of COVID. All these were built out as interactive mapping tool applications. So somebody can go to one of these apps and find a place, find the status, find out you know where to go, what's near them, um, whatever it may be. Um, the one in the middle there, cooling centers, feels like it may be really useful this week. Um, and we actually maintain updated cooling center information, um, not just for COVID, but just in general. You need to go somewhere um, where where is open where how much space do they have those kinds of things and on and on food resources um, emergency notifications we built a whole bunch of dashboards across the county that are all public facing tools basically they all function the same way you type in your address or the area you're interested in and it tells you what's nearby and then you can start querying with that this fairly user-friendly tools another thing in the in the news quite a bit these days is uh, the digital divide. Um, and obviously everybody's dealing with this. So we knew early on uh, when COVID hit that we had all these kids homeschooling, we have people working from home. How, how are people gonna get connected? Um, and this data actually comes from the US Census Bureau, not from the county. We don't ma maintain uh, internet connectivity data at the, at the household level. But the Census Bureau does, and we can use these kinds of data sets in conjunction with other data we manage to understand where are the most in need areas for internet connectivity and how do we get those kids hotspots or Chromebooks or whatever they may need working with their school districts or the libraries so they can go to school. Um, and that was a huge issue, especially at the early days of COVID because we were in the middle of the spring term and nobody was ready for it. By fall, it went a lot better. Um, another thing that came out of that same sort of issue was how do I find free Wi-Fi if I don't have internet at home? You know, is there somewhere I can go to do my homework or to submit a application for public assistance or to find a place to go get a COVID vaccination, whatever it might be. Um, so early on, uh, we were asked to start building out a, a Wi-Fi locator. This has been an interesting project. I've worked with my grad students at Long Beach on this as well. Um, 
to, to continue to evolve this tool because everybody always wants free Wi-Fi. So we have a combination here. The big dots on that map are public sites in the sense that they are run by a government agency. So county libraries, parks, other types of rec centers and things like that. The smaller dots, uh, and this will, is evolving since this screenshot, are green dots are Starbucks and yellow dots are McDonald's. Uh, we worked with some partners from a nonprofit to build out data scrapers to pull all the data off of McDonald's and Starbucks websites because we knew every one of their locations has, has public Wi-Fi for free. Um, and most of them would let you sit there or you know, and use it. So this locator, same idea, public facing tool where you can put in an address and a search radius and it'll tell you what your options are for Wi-Fi near any location. Um, so these are the kinds of tools that COVID initiated, but I'd say, you know, this is another one that's very useful as we go into the future. This is just a service people, you know, like to know about when they come into an area. Couple screenshots just on location analytics in general. So on this Wi-Fi idea, one of the other questions was, well, okay, but if there's Wi-Fi at some park or library, who can, you know, and kids need it for school, how are they gonna get there? Can they get there? So on this one, you can see the purple areas are in areas in higher need of internet access, they don't have it. Um, and the polygon in blue here is a 15 minute walk zone around that public facility, park or library. So we can see we're not covering a whole lot of this area very well from that particular location, but this one over here is even worse. This is an area where most people have internet at home. So yes, you can go there, but you know, it's not as convenient for the people who maybe are most in need of access. And we also ran these things in, a, in the opposite direction. The gray uh, blobs here are a 15 minute walk from every metro station. So when you start putting these things together, you can understand how could I get there? Is it in a reasonable distance once I get off the bus or the train to get to that location where maybe I could go to the public library and, and use the facilities? Uh, this became really important and it still is as we're working on digital divide issues because it helps us to prioritize where do we need to beef up Wi-Fi? Where do we need to add new public Wi-Fi resources? Um, and the county's put huge investments into those uh, going back to last summer uh, to build out more high-speed connectivity at more of our facilities for just these reasons to fill in some of these gaps. And now we're actually doing the same thing to build partnerships with more of the private sector um, to see if we can get Wi-Fi into some of these other neighborhoods uh, that don't, don't currently have it. And there's, a, I could go on for th probably three days just on applications of GIS and government. Um, I'm not gonna go into any more right now at this, at this point, but I'd say, you know, a big part of this is where do we get the data and how do we get the data? And just like everything we all learned in our computer science 101, garbage in, garbage out, if we don't get good data, if we can't rely on good data, um, just like in anything we do with a database, it's the same in geospatial applications and geospatial databases. If we have bad data, we have bad answers. If we have good data, we have good answers. So a couple of things we've been working towards over the last several years, as everyone has. One is to collect our own data, which we do a lot of, and hopefully moving away from the person out in the field with the clipboard and the pen to somebody on a mobile app. It may surprise you, it may not, but government's not always the quickest to adopt technology. And we, when I arrived at the county just three years ago, I could not count on my fingers the number of organizations in the county that were still using paper. Uh, I, need, I needed my toes and probably somebody else's as well. Uh, the idea of moving to smartphones and tablets was fairly foreign to most county operations. We've improve that greatly over the last several years, again, driven by, in many cases, just the need, the emergencies. Um, when we've had some of these big fires, sending people out to do damage assessments with tablets instead of paper was able to streamline the process of doing those assessments and getting people insurance settlements or rebuilding permits after a fire or after some other kind of an event. So moving more towards digital data collection. And of course, if you're doing it on a mobile device, you also can be ingesting that data in real time instead of waiting for somebody to come back into the office and key it all in with all the errors and everything else that goes with that. So it's not perfect. We have a long way to go. And I'd say, again, this is one of the places, you know, 
industry and academia can probably help all local governments is to, to do a better job in collecting data in digital formats and that are you know, geo-referenced and ready to go and clean um, and do and meet the needs. Uh, we have several projects with outside consultants who are working on these kinds of things now. Of course, you can't do geospatial without drones because everyone loves drones these days. Um, and I, I'm gonna pick on the firefighters a little bit because you know, they are the classic boys with toys. Um, if you use that old saying, that's not gender appropriate. Uh, the fire department were the first people in the county to say, we're gonna get drones because they sound really fun, but they didn't really know what to do with them um, until we had a fire. Um, so about three years ago, um, the Woolsey fire up near Malibu on the LA County Ventura County border area um, broke out. And I was fairly new to the county, but we were able to go out and do some more intentional, well thought out, well planned use cases of how drone imagery could be used. Um, so this particular image that's on the bottom right is a 3D rendering of an area called Trancus Canyon, just outside of Malibu up in you know, the northern part of the county that was impacted by the fire. Um, in 30 minutes, we flew that whole subdivision. We were able to bring all those images back, a couple hundred images from the drones. We flew two drones um, over that area, standing actually in this park that you see on the left. And we could come back and process that data out and have a real, you know, a, a near real time you know, image of what happened in that area. We could see which houses burned, how severely they burned, were they totally destroyed or partially damaged um, or not at all touched. And that's, that's much more efficient to go out and get that whole area in 30 minutes than to send out a bunch of people on the ground in trucks, navigating through all the, the chaos that's going on when there's an active fire to start doing that. In fact, you wouldn't, you would wait till the fire is totally under control and then send people out on the ground. Um, so that 30 minutes and then admittedly a couple hours of processing time on the back end to build out the 3D models and, and the full image and, and point cloud, uh, it's still much quicker than, than on the groundwork. Since then, and, and much more recently, other departments in the county have found utility in drone imagery and, and image analysis as well. So here's another example from our planning department where they're going out and doing facility inspections for either permits or illegal dumping or other types of, of property uh, assessments. Um, there's other applications I have on the list here, but this one in particular is kind of interesting. Um, this is a, a wrecking yard somewhere in the east side of LA, downtown LA area. Um, and if you imagine an inspector going out and walking around the site, yes, they can sort of see what's going on, but what they saw in the drone imagery they weren't able to see on the ground was something you can barely see circled here. It was a bunch of gas tanks that had been thrown up on the roof of the building. You might wonder why. Uh, well, gas tanks are considered a hazardous item because they have gas in them, uh, potentially. They're also a fire hazard, you know, if there's gas and gas fumes in them. They were just chucking them up on the roof to get them out of sight and out of mind. And an inspector never would see that on the ground. But again, by throwing a drone up and getting imagery, that became readily apparent in a matter of minutes. Um, and then action for that illegal dumping or illegal you know, handling of the material could be, could be addressed. And it gives you the photographic evidence to build that up. So this leads me to sort of the, the, the second part of the presentation I really wanna focus on imagery. Uh, so we have an imagery consortium in LA County that's referred to as LARIAC. It's a collection of many government agencies, cities, it's the county, it's several university partners um, and, and a few others. Um, other agency types that collectively come together to collect aerial imagery over the county on a regular basis. And governments use imagery all the time. We've done this since, you know, the, the I don't know, the early days of airplanes and aerial photography, certainly by the 40s and 50s. Um, so what you can see here are a couple of examples. Um, this is just a straight down bird's eye uh, ortho photo. On the right, we have an oblique 45 degree view. Um, all these images are fully geo-referenced. You can think Google you know, imagery on Google Maps or Google Earth, but our imagery is engineering grade. So when I go in and measure as I can the height of a building or the dimensions of a building or a parcel, I'm getting that to an accuracy that is adequate for planning decisions, for you know, 
for making permitting decisions, for doing real work. It's not, uh, it's within a matter of sub foot accuracy, whereas something like Google, not to pick on them, you know, their imagery may be off by tens of feet. Um, it's fine to the eye, but it's not fine for making real decisions and real analysis from. Um, the other thing that you may have noticed is the imagery on the left. It's got weird colors. That's because it's multispectral. It's got an infrared band in it. So that's actually capturing photosynthetic activity. Everything showing up red here in this false color image is actively growing vegetation, which tells me in LA, in Southern California, that's irrigated. Somebody's putting water on that to keep it from dying, <laughs> you know, except this one lawn that you may notice on the corner of the cul-de-sac that's bright green. And since I don't have the interactivity, I'll just tell you the answer. That's artificial turf. It's green because it's not alive. It's not photosynthetically active. And in this kind of image collection, we can tell that. So we actually know that those people aren't watering their lawn because they don't have to. Um, so we can use these kinds of images for a lot of assessments. A um, little bit of context on Lariac, and then I'm gonna get into the applications in more detail. It's been around for uh, about 15 years now. We do a three-year cycle where we collect a high quality engineering grade image at the first year of each cycle. And then we collect other data um, that's very close to engineering grade, but not quite um, in the intervening years. So we're in our sixth cycle of that. Um, and what it's done is two big things. I'm not gonna read the whole list of stuff to you. One is now we have changed from a mode where each city went out and contracted their own data for with their own vendors and it was not compatible or consistent to we have countywide data that everybody uses that's consistent across the entire county. So we can work across jurisdictional boundaries, we can get accurate, consistent, repeatable um, analysis out of our data, and everybody saves money because each jurisdiction isn't running their own RFPs, their own contracting, all that. There's one contract for everybody and it saves all that overhead cost as well. So it's a win-win. And I think the contractors appreciate it too because they deal with one entity instead of 88 entities plus you know, the county. Um, so it's a lot easier on both sides. And we get a number of standard, I'll call them standard products, but I, um, you see my frowny face on the third bullet, uh, not enough. Um, so we do get topographic surface models. We get the landform, um, high, high quality contours, great for project engineering plans, for water runoff, for all kinds of stuff. We get building footprints. That's what you see here on the left. That's Dodger Stadium outlined in yellow um, as a structure. Um, the ones in green that are around, um, if you look on the, the legend, those are new structures, meaning they were not there the last time we did this analysis three years earlier. So this is that issue of, oh, the property assessor now can see you added onto your house. It, it was modified or it's a new structure you put up. Um, this lets our assessment unit actually have every change in the county. And we have 4 million parcels. So you don't wanna run around on the ground looking for changes in 4 million parcels. We can pull that out of our database in a matter of seconds and target if and where we need to go on the ground if at all, um, to look at those changes. Often they can do the assessment updates right on their screen. Um, and then we do land cover mapping. Well, we did it once um, and I'll come back to that. So imagery is really valuable for change assessment. You could probably see that already from the last slide, but here's just a series um, of the Grand Park downtown LA. Um, LA City Hall is sort of down here to the left. This is the County Hall of uh, uh, Hall of Administration and the County Courthouse and then the big park. And I'm just going to go through a quick series. Here's 2003. Here's 2006. 2011, you can see the whole park is ripped up. They were doing a major construction project. If you look in other areas, you probably see changes too. Um, 2011, 2014, 2017, and so on. Um, I didn't put the 2020 in here, but I have it. So when we're doing these assessments with repeated measurable quality data, we can do you know, a lot of really interesting things on infrastructure change, vegetation change, and so on. Here's an example um, with drones on the Bobcat fire I showed you earlier. So this is the parking lot at Devil's Punch Bowl, if you happen to know that area. And this is the before image. This is the after image. And what you can see when I zoom in a little bit is um, there was a, that big building that was there is gone. That's why it has a res data. We 
tagged it as, as burned out. This building's fine. The trees that are bright red are actively growing. They're still alive, but all the trees that are scattered out around that are not bright red are either largely burned, like some of these that are a little bit pink, or if they're black, like these, they got totally killed by the fire. We can quickly start to see where there's opportunities to understand what's the level of damage to the built or the natural environment. This is all where I get really frustrated with government. These analyses are still done visually for the most part. It's me doing what I just talked through with, um, with staff. They tag, they click on that building and say, it's gone. That's not, as effective as if we can start using machine learning, you know, automation types of approaches to really find this stuff for it. We do it on the building footprints through a contractor, but we don't have the tools to rapidly build out machine learning algorithms or image classification algorithms for these kinds of things in other contexts, except sort of the out of the box ones the vendors do. Street level imagery is moving this way too. This is a, an image from, uh, it looks like something like Google Street View. It's actually, several orders of magnitude higher quality cameras and they also drive a lidar with it which means we get a full 3d model of the streetscape from the data collection and what we can do here is the same kind of thing we can start pulling out everything you see with a dot on it through machine learning is pulled out of the data set so we can geolocate and map every manhole cover every traffic sign and what sign it is is it you know based on a, a dot code that signs use we can measure heights of bridges and, and light poles and know how high of a, a cherry picker do i need to change the bulb uh, before i drive out there and in fact with if i'm looking up in the imagery i can read the wattage on the light poles uh, and see what the bulb wattage is before i go out there so i can start building out databases that are really robust and useful where somebody can do the whole project planning process before they leave the office, take the right stuff with them, the right equipment, the right, you know, the right tools, the right supplies, and deal with the problem in most cases the first time. Uh, because these are full 3D models too, we can see things like, are there places where drainages on streets are, aren't good while we're getting puddling or, or things like that? Are we getting poorly crowned streets? We can pull all the paint lines off the streets and classify that. So these are things that, industry has started to help us with, but they're very targeted to specific use cases. Um, the last one here at the bottom is the ramp at the corner. The ADA ramps for crossings um, have very specific requirements for slope and width and so on. We can now get all those measurements from our desktops instead of going out in the field, and that's really powerful. Okay, so where are we going? This is sort of the, the big reveal at the end, right? Um, trees are my passion because my PhD is actually, actually in forest remote sensing and GIS. So I come out of tree land, um, I guess you could say. And government needs to track trees. We have all these street trees that, we, uh, that are public trees. We have parks, we have all the golf courses. We have all these facilities that are managed by government. And we do a pretty good job knowing about our own trees, but what we, don't do is we don't do it frequently enough. Many cities, the county, whoever it is, they may do a street tree assessment on a once a decade basis or a, if they're really good, maybe they do five or six year rotations. The reason is because typical arborist companies charge anywhere from four to $8 per tree to go out and assess it. And they drive around to their pickup trucks and they go look at every tree and they update a database. So that's not something you can do all the time. And we know even less about the trees that are not on the public lands, the tree in your backyard, the tree in a business park. Um, and the problem there is when we're talking about big issues like fire, when we're talking about insects and drought and things that lead to the, the trees being burnable, um, you really wanna know about all the trees, not just the ones down the street that are on the public right away. You wanna know about the trees that might burn through the neighborhood. And we don't have that data traditionally. So we know we could do this. Um, and that's, so I, I went out and got some grant money and hooked up with some, some partners and we're gonna go after this problem. We are going after this problem. How do we know not just the public trees, but also the private trees and also what kind of tree it is, how big it is and how healthy it is. So when we think about that at the high level, that's really what, you know, 
this kind of a, of a big, large scale, you know, remember 4,000 square miles of county, we want to map every tree in the county ultimately and be able to do that on a regular basis, not once a decade, but hey, but how about once every year? Um, so when we have an insect infestation or a drought, we see the, the wave of tree condition changing and we can get in front of those problems before they become insurmountable. So, you know, working with remotely sensed symmetry, working with, you know, all this, this data, we can get at those things. And that's really the goal of the project is get those frequent, repeatable measurements out of our data sets, and then be able to use those in analytical models to say, where do we go do preventative measures? Where do we need to go talk to community residents about how they're clearing around their houses, whatever it might be. Um, so I already alluded to the, the main things, species, canopy cover, and health. The things in green are the things we don't do very well now. We know trees are out there, but we don't know what kind of trees. And that matters when you're talking about certain things like, is that tree at risk for burning, for insect damage, for drought tolerance, whatever it may be. Um, we are pretty good at canopy because we can see that from the air. Um, we're very bad at health um, traditionally. So our, uh, from an IT perspective, there's three really big goals here. One, I want to use data that's readily available. I've got the LARIAC data because we have a program. I also have data from other agencies like NASA that are collected and freely available. I want to use open source tools and technology to the degree possible so I don't have to buy a bunch of expensive custom software no one knows how to use. And I want to do this all in a you know, academic peer-reviewed manner. So for this project, we're actually already underway with some preliminary work. Um, we're using three things from Lariac. Um, we've got our LIDAR data, which is our, our, our laser range finding data that gets us our topography. That's also used for getting tree heights. Um, we're using our imagery, which is three to four inch ground resolution collected annually. And we've got our old land cover map from a few years ago. That's the one on the right here. Everything green is a tree. That's all we got out of that land cover last time. I can't take credit, I wasn't there. But the new spin, and this is where I think it gets really interesting from a data analytics perspective is this average data. And if you're not familiar with the remote sensing world, this is kind of getting out there a little bit, but we're very lucky to have JPL in LA County because they fly their systems over LA County a lot when they're developing and testing them. Now, Everest has been around for quite a while, you can see, since 1994. It's not a new system, but it's used frequently for different, different reasons. So there's tons of data over LA County. What this is, is instead of a typical red, green, blue image like you have on your computer monitor you're watching on now, or your camera on your phone, um, or your TV, that's what we see with our eyes. Everest actually has 224 spectral bands. So way, way more data. It's a data cube as shown in the picture there. Now, some of those bands are still visible. It's instead of one green band, you have green split up into a dozen shades of green and you can pick out which green it is. That's really useful when you start thinking about trees or vegetation mapping and knowing the species. You also get a lot of these bands in these near infrared and infrared ranges that Actually, we can't see with our eyes, but in false color imagery, we can start to use those bands to also understand more about species and condition. So the idea here is we use Avarice data plus Lariac data to get what I'll call the best of both worlds. Avarice is really great spectrally. There's a lot of resolution there, but it's not very good spatially. As you can see here, it's only a 20 meter by 20 meter ground resolution. So that could be several trees in a pixel. But when I combine that with the three inch pixels of Lariac, I can do image fusion between those two and start to have something where I get spatial and spectral resolution combined plus 3D imagery or 3D LIDAR data to get things like height and structure. Now I've got something I can really work with. Um, and the other nice thing about Avarice, if things go as hopefully they do is these kinds of sensors right now are largely flown in aircraft, but NASA is looking to, and already has done testing of orbital versions of a sensor. Once it's in orbit, you would get an image cube like this, not once a year, but once every couple of days. 
So when you think about a fast moving insect infestation as we have right now in Southern California in Orange County as well, or a fast moving fire scenario, that becomes really valuable. You're getting close to you know, regular updates where you can really understand things. So the way this works, you know, without getting too into the weeds is a lot of computer processing. This is where we need people who think about machine learning and statistical analysis and all the other factors of, of the analytics to really get this stuff to work. So we have to take that hyperspectral data and do some statistical, you know, magic to really transform and understand the key factors. That might be something like a PCA, principal components analysis, or other versions of things like that to really get to what am I seeing in a, I can know it's a crown from my basic imagery, but what am I seeing in that that tells me something about species? How am I using the resolution of Lariat high, high spatial resolution to pull apart mixed pixels from the average data? How do I make these things work together? Um, how do I leverage the LIDAR data, point cloud, the 3D data to start pulling apart where one tree crown ends and the next one begins if the trees are next to each other? If I start seeing the shape of the crown, I can understand that structural data enough to start segmenting the image into different individual trees. So that becomes another piece of the process. And then using some tools like faster RCNN or others convoluted neural networks, it's, in the, it's abbreviated there, but it's in the picture. Um, we can start thinking about how can we start to build out algorithms that really understand, so to speak, uh, what the factors in those first two are that really gets us down to an individual tree object level and, and can start to say, this is a oak tree, it's healthy, and it's this tall, you know, and this big in diameter and this big of a crown size. Now we're getting useful statistics. So this project is underway working with UCLA and Colorado, uh, University of Colorado Boulder um, and the county. And yeah, you know, we're only about six months into it, but we're already seeing fairly promising results on some of the test data that we're pretty confident we're going to be able to build out tools that can do this for at least, you know, probably somewhere between 10 and 15 of our keystone species we really want to track. Another one being fruits, fruit, you know, citrus species where we have fruit fly issues. If you have a, you know, an orange or a lemon tree in your backyard, again, we don't know that, but that could be a important thing to know if we're trying to stop an infestation spreading across a region. So I'm gonna wrap up with just a few observations and comments. Um, I think, you know, I've touched on a few. There are tons of ways we can use imagery and image processing, machine learning and AI and various combinations to start taking this imagery that we've been collecting forever and actually turn it from a pretty picture into useful data. Um, I That was my, my number one complaint of the county when I came in and my number one comment in my job interview, I said, you're wasting your money on Lariat because you're not pulling data out of the imagery. And now we're starting to move more towards doing that. Um, but there's a lot more that can be done. I mean, you start thinking about infrastructure, you start thinking about, you know, landforms and we've done some things with solar modeling for, you know, solar rooftop, you know, uh, energy generation. You think about urban heat islands, you can go down the list miles and come up with lots of use cases where you want to identify things. I've been asked about, can we pull all the HVAC data off? You know, who's got rooftop HVAC on these downtown buildings because we want to track Legionnaire's disease outbreaks. There's all kinds of things across all sectors of government. The other thing we've seen is this idea of work from home. Originally, no one thought in government, you know, they're really about, we want butts and seats. We want to see you in your cubicle to know you're working. Now we've seen that we actually can do a lot of stuff from our desktops. We can actually do analytical assessments from our desktops using and leveraging these kinds of data sets in imagery in mapping and bringing them together and building out analytical tools, indices and, and, and feature extractions. Um, but we need to do better still, I think. But one of the things I'm really happy that's happened with our board of supervisors just in the last two weeks is they finally come to the conclusion because we're going to be getting that ARPA funding for COVID, $2 billion is coming to LA County, billion with a B. How do you allocate that money to the places it's needed, the neighborhoods and the communities it's most needed? In the old days, and the old days may have been like six months ago, we have five supervisorial districts. They would divide by five and say everyone gets a fifth. 
And because they all want their fair share as elected officials, they like to show their constituents they're doing stuff. But I'll tell you what, the need for certain things, county programs for, you know, preventing evictions or helping people get back to work or getting whatever, you know, childcare services, whatever it may be in East LA is very different than in Malibu. And I guarantee the people in Malibu don't need the same investment in their neighborhoods that the people in East LA do. I'm not saying there aren't people in a given community that may be wealthy that still need help, but we can use all of our, our data about our population demographics to understand maybe you don't divide by five. Maybe you put more into you know, South LA, East LA, you know, in the Valley and less into the coastal communities where people are doing pretty well. They have their internet access, they have their childcare, you know, they have their jobs um, and all that. So that's a huge analytics thing. We're now building out, it'll be a little while, an equity mapping tool to help county departments understand how to allocate resources and programs more effectively to the communities that meet their targeted audience or need instead of just throwing it out there because they happen to have an office or a clinic in that area. Um, it's letting us turn around data and decisions much faster, of, sort, of course. Um, my favorite thing, though, is this second to last bullet. Um, we get rid of human error. Um, when we can collect data digitally with well-controlled you know, databases and get it into the systems and we're not coding things off of paper and we're not looking at a picture and saying, I think that house burned down. I'm not sure, I think that's an oak tree, but I'm not sure if we can get the computer to help us with that. Yes, it's not gonna be perfect, but we can improve the algorithm we, and it'll be consistent. Um, we get rid of that inconsistency. And then at the end of the day, the execs, the electeds, all the people who make the decisions, they don't wanna read stats and reports anyway. You give them a picture, you show them that's the spot based on what you told us you wanna know. And the map tells the story in about two seconds. So what you can do out there, um, number one, I said at the beginning, we've got tons of data. I don't know on the left, we've got our county open data portal and on the right, our GIS open data portal. Those are two separate worlds. We're going to change that someday soonish um, and make that all interoperable one world. But the stuff on the left is stuff that's essentially tables. The stuff on the right is map data with with database, geo databases with it. Um, but there's a ton of data out there. We have three or 400 data layers just in, in our GIS side. I don't even know how much data they have in the open data portal. But there's a lot of data waiting for some creative entrepreneur or organization to say, hey, we could build an app to do X and we could probably make money doing that. I mean, Google and Apple figured that out a long time ago with, that, with their mapping tools. And they're probably doing pretty well because they know we get all this public data, we make it useful, and we've got a product. Um, there's also things we as government can use help with, you know, to make our data more useful as well. So we can turn data into information. I've shown you a few examples. Here's a few others. But you can too. You can take government data, free data. It's all open in the U.S. You don't have to pay for it uh, for the most part. A few things are restricted due to licensing agreements with the contractors or the vendors, but most of our data is open and it's available. Um, so we've done some things and, and you can, I'll get, all these links will be available when we post up the slides, um, but there's a lot you can do too at, or partner with us. So I'm gonna leave you with those kind of thoughts. Be creative, make your tax dollars work better wherever you live, wherever you work, um, and it'll go along with it a long way. And then, of course, I'd be remiss if I don't sell something, right? So here's a couple of books um, I've actually co-authored with my wife or co-edited. Um, so I'm just going to say, if you're interested in geospatial GIS and you haven't really worked in that realm because you're coming out of a more traditional IT side, and I said for the hardware folks, uh, we need help building better sensors, better field tools, better you know, you know, better data collection stuff. Those are all things in the, on the research and application side. I think industry and academia can really be helpful. Government has ideas. I could give you a long list of things I'd like to see, but I don't have the ability to engineer a new sensor or engineer a new software product. That's where we need the, the cooperation and public-private partnership. Um, the one on the right, Resilient Communities, is an edited volume and came out earlier this year and it's just what it says. It's looking at different kinds of resilience and analytical applications and mapping with GIS and imagery.
to help community resilience, whether that's environmental or economic or social. So with that, I have no idea what time I was supposed to go till, but I'm gonna end it now. <laughs> and thank you all for taking the time to join us tonight and listen in. And with that, I'll turn it back to Alan. Great, thanks for that. Uh, hey, great, Steve. Thanks for that great talk. Um, very cool to hear about data-driven local government decisions. Uh, that's pretty exciting. And who knew about all the stuff that goes into urban tree sensing stuff? So I thought that was pretty fascinating. Um, and we have a, a question coming in here. So uh, if you like, if you would, uh, this one's from uh, Windsor Brown. If you would like to pose a challenge to university data scientists, consider offering your data for a data fest competition. So it's a little bit more of a announcement, I think. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, yeah, yep. go ahead. I was going to say to Windsor though, uh, please, uh, let me know how to, who, who, who to contact for that. <laughs> yeah, right. I've got tons uh, of data. Now, uh, yep. We have another, uh, uh, attendee say to, uh, that is asking what opportunities exist for LA area high school and university uh, students to do targeted projects in this space? That's a good question given that you've got open data and open APIs, I think. Yes, so I would say a number of things actually. So for the high schools um, in particular, I'll start with, we, I had it on one of my slides just as a picture um, and you'll have the links uh, when these are shared. We're kicking off a new program in LA County as part of the, our digital divide work called Delete the Divide. And if you just go to deletethedivide.org, you can find it. Uh, and the idea of that program is to expose kids from middle school through high school and actually even up into community college levels um, to ways they can use information technology, tools, software, you know, programming, or even peripheral things like design you know, or something to see some opportunities for themselves in their career. So on the GIS or geospatial side specifically, we're working with ESRI or ESRI, uh, which is our big GIS software company in the world across the hill in, in Redlands. Um, they have worked with the county, we're, we're building out right now the curriculum to launch for this fall. Students individually or through their schools can sign up for Delete the Divide. It's not just GIS, it's we've got partnerships with Google and Amazon and uh, you know, all the big players offering curriculum and certifications. But the GIS part in particular, Esri has given us a full on access to their platforms and tools and licenses so we can spin up schools through the Delete the Divide program and work with kids and teachers to start doing these things either on their own from home or in their classroom environment as a class or a school. Um, so that's one huge opportunity just to start getting involved and doing projects. Initially, we hope they'll start doing projects just in their own neighborhood, you know, things they're curious about um, in their in their own area. Um, and there's there's precedent for this kind of stuff in a few schools in LA County already. Um, for university students, um, I'd say a couple things uh, as well. One is, as I alluded to, I am actively involved with working with universities on a regular basis. So the project I alluded to, we're working with UCLA, um, but I work, I teach at Cal State Long Beach in their master's geospatial science program. Um, we regularly have students do their, their master's project work on LA County data, not exclusively because there's other nonprofits and other agencies that also have projects worked on in the same model. So at least in that sort of a formal sense, same thing with USC, they have a spatial sciences program at the graduate level and at the undergraduate level, and they, their faculty will contact me and say, hey, we've got students looking for a project, how can we help? And we come up with something. We partner them with an appropriate county department, appropriate data sets and questions, and then they can go off and build a new analysis, a new tool, a new whatever. Um, just one small example there. Uh, my Long Beach students uh, for the Wi-Fi locator I showed, to show where Wi-Fi is. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't launched it yet, but they've built out a mobile app. So when people are out roaming around, they can add Wi-Fi hotspots to our database, but the app is doing it in the background. So it has to validate 
the Wi-Fi is public. It doesn't have any bad language in it. Like it's not somebody's, you know, mis, you know, badly named, you know, personal network. And it has to geographically fall inside LA County. If it doesn't meet the basic criteria, it won't even submit. But if it does, then they can give information on, it, do you have to buy something? Is there indoor or outdoor seating? Is there power? Is it noisy or not? Could I have a Zoom meeting? So there's a, a little simple form they fill out on a web app and then it populates our database instantaneously. And because it's collecting that in the background, um, it also lets us to validate sites. So as more people enter a Wi-Fi site, you know, more, multiple visits, we'll start getting better information about those sites, that they're real, we get signal strength and, and range and all sorts of other stats just on the back end, out of the app. So people don't have to enter that, it's just already populated. So that's, that's just one simple example. Um, we had another group working on our addressing system, our CAM system I alluded to, because we have some wonky areas, especially up near Lancaster, where the street naming and addressing is just not following any sensible conventions we would expect. I don't know how they mapped that place originally. So helping to build improved geolocation tools for geocoding so that those things work. So I'd say, you know, and I do the same with some of the community colleges and, and others, I'm just naming a few. So simplest way, contact us. Go to the, the county's GIS site, gis.lacounty.gov. You'll find how to contact us. You'll find out a lot of our data. We'd love to work on projects. So that's as a, as a sort of part-time professor now, full-time performer, um, uh, there's nothing that makes me happier than getting kids and university students involved in real projects. They learn and then they become my future employees potentially and they understand what we need. And we get a lot of students eventually into our workforce that way. Um, awesome. So uh, Andrew uh, is asking, what software does the county use for its uh, GIS operations? Is it publicly available? I think you guys use Ezra, you mentioned. Um, I don't know. Uh, yes. Uh, well, yeah. So I'll say a couple of things. So Esri is commercial software. It is licensed. Um, if you're interested in learning about it, though, you can go to their website and sign up for a free personal account in their web platform. It's not as full blown as their desktop enterprise software, but you can do a lot of stuff on their web cloud-based tools now. Um, and you can get a free personal account that does some limited stuff. For those that are more adventurous, I and I keep a copy on my own computer, QGIS is an open source GIS that's pretty nice desktop software that does almost everything the commercial stuff does. In some cases, better than the commercial stuff does. It'll process imagery, it'll process LiDAR point clouds, it'll do all kinds of cool stuff. So QGIS is another one. We use it at the county for certain things. We use other open source tools and extensions for certain things as well. But our primary is Esri, which is because they're sort of industry standard. I sometimes call them the Microsoft of GIS. Like, you know, if you're still using WordStar, good luck. You know, everyone's using Word. You know, that's just, that's the world we're in with GIS. You can use other stuff, but everyone out there uses Esri. Right, makes sense. Uh, Daniel asks, uh, what privacy issues does the Office of GIS run into? I can see the junk car manager screaming, privacy invasion. Either that or they look at UAVs like clay pigeons. That's a fair question. So there's a couple answers there. Number one, in that case and others like it, the inspector actually talks to the proprietor. They know they're being inspected and they have approval to fly the drone. If they say no, it doesn't happen. Um, so it's not like we're going in and spying on people, you know, in that sense. Um, the, you know, there is a number of questions around drones in particular, um, you know, and what the privacy issues are with drones. If you go back to way early in the aerial photo days, back in the 70s, there was a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court that, that sort of determined at that time, and I don't know if it'll hold for drones, that you don't own the airspace above your property. It's open skies, it's, you know, above the blades of grass was the language the Supreme Court of the United States used. So if it's visible from the air and I see it, tough luck. You're, if you're in trouble, you're in trouble. Um, that was in a case against Dow Chemical Corporation that didn't like that they flew an airplane over one of their facilities and busted them for something or other at the time. Um, so, so far, I don't think anything's gone that high on drones, um, but we just are, you know, we take precaution in the sense that we ask before we fly. 
makes sense. Uh, Ron asks, does LARIAC provide for a LIDAR coverage for the full county? How often are you doing the building footprint assessments for, you know, Delta or changes? So yes, is the short answer. Um, we do have the data, <laughs> but we don't provide it. The U.S. Geological Survey provides it. So we collect LIDAR typically in partnership with USGS because they're trying to do this nationally. And and they set the standards for what's required and the, Q, the QAQC on that data. So, and part of the deal is they also don't just help fund it, they also host it. So if you go look up the USGS national map, that's their website for all kinds of spatial data that the, the feds make available, you can go in there and zoom in on any part of the country. It'll show you where there's LIDAR coverage available and you can download the point cloud, the digital elevation models. Um, often there's other data sets that also available there. Um, because it's federal and national coverage, many of the other data sets don't have the detail that you would get if you go to the local government's website, um, you know, because at the county or the city level, we obviously collect more detail than the feds, but LIDAR data is LIDAR data. So you can get that freely from the USGS national map website. Mm -hmm. And on the footprint part, um, we're running those every three years at present. But again, the, that goes to one of sort of my asks all you in academia and industry is, you know, that's because we can't do it ourselves. We have to actually contract that out to a vendor. So if you're in the industry side, that's good for you. Um, but if we can have tools that are standardized and reliable and validated that we can run ourselves, we actually fly on an annual basis. We just don't have the money to pay the vendor to do the building footprints every year. So if we had an, uh, an algorithm that could extract building footprints, that'd be awesome. The hard thing with building footprints, some of you may be familiar with, Microsoft has put out a, nat a global building footprint database. It's out there on GitHub somewhere, if you Google for it. Their building footprints are pretty lousy. And it's because buildings get obstructed by trees, buildings get obstructed by other buildings, shadows, other things, you know, make it hard to see the true footprint. One of our biggest problems is covered porches, is that that's not really part of the building from an assessment standpoint, if your back porches has a roof over it. But I, from, from an aerial view, I can't really tell that. So finding ways to do better at building footprints and make it quick and repeatable and, and maybe even open source, um, that would be great. Um, and that's, I would love to see that so we could do it annually instead of every three years. Okay. Uh, another person is asking, uh, do you think um, industry part participation would be um, increased if this data enabled geofence autonomous driving in the future? I don't know, maybe it already is, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure on, the, the autonomous driving stuff as much. I know one of the, you know, obviously, you know, I didn't talk too much about it, but our addressing database, CAMS, also is our street sensor line database. And that's what most governments currently collect and, and maintain is the center line. But for autonomous vehicles, it's not the center line that's important. It's the lanes and how many lanes in which directions. So I can't just follow, you know, I can't use the county center line data to, to start driving an autonomous vehicle. Um, so I think there could be value. And, you know, certainly, you know, there are, I know my car has a geofencing option and the GPS, on, you know, that's already built in. You know, if I give it to a valet, it'll tell me if it goes more than a half mile from the restaurant, right? Um, yeah. And they're joyriding. I don't know what I would do other than yell at them later <laughs> because they've got my car, right? Uh, but yeah, those those things are there. I think there is room for that. I'm not sure how much that's going to come from government versus private or some partnership. I think the data that's interesting that we're just starting to get into is that street view data I showed a couple of shots of because again, that's imagery and lidar on a 360 hemisphere driving down the street. That data set you can pull the street width and the lane lines and all the other data out of, again, if you pay the vendor. Um, so there are vendors doing that sort of work, but I don't know how much they're intersecting with the autonomous vehicle industry right now. I'm sure somebody is. 